Good morning. What happened to fall? <laughs> now, I'm from Chicago, so this is cool with me. I mean, I'm, I'm also optimized for cold weather. You can tell looking, looking at me. When that uh, global warming thing hits, I'm in trouble. Um, uh, I joined the Encyclopedia of Life back at the beginning of, of 2010, and at that time, the organization was looking to uh, prepare itself for a future that, frankly, it wanted to be a very long one. And the idea was to reach out and find an individual from industry who had experience with this question, what's next? And there are people out there who know how to figure out what's next. Um, you don't just have to be a visionary like the sainted Steve Jobs. There are protocols, there are processes that you can follow to understand where you are and where you're going as an organization. And those sorts of people are called product managers. So they interviewed a bunch of product managers. I was very lucky to have been given the opportunity to join the team. And as part of my interview, I was asked to describe the, the discipline of product management and how you build products. And as I was reflecting on what to talk about at TED today, um, I wanted to share with you a process that you can take away to uh, figure out what's next in your business or your life. And, and I know it, it's difficult to see out there. So for those of you who are involved in, in organizations or, or um, uh, walks of life that build products or services, can you quack like a duck? All right, that's a lot of quacking. Now, the, the ducks are important. Ducks, if you, you recall looking at a duck, they kind of glide across the surface of the water. They look kind of cool when they're doing it. But underneath, they're paddling like hell. And it's not pretty. And I'm sure all of you, as you're working to build what's next, feel that uh, you're trying to stay cool, but what you're building is actually causing lots of challenges. And that relates to this challenge. Many organizations... I could be here all day, um, <laughs> as long as it's only 12 minutes. Um, many organizations, many people mistake activity for progress. It's really easy to get busy. It's really easy to decide you want to do something. You got a pile of money. You got some people out there who think you think you want to serve, who've come to you and said, yeah, I'd really buy that. I'd really use it. And you get a bunch of people together, and you start coding, you start planning, you start working, and then a little bit further down the road, you kind of orient yourself. This is the don't worry, be crappy school <laughs> of getting things done. Now, there is another approach, um, kind of an un-American approach, because this one feels American to me. You know, let's go, we're action people. We're not going to do something. This is the, the other way of approaching the challenge, which is to you decide you want to do something, and we're going to pick it to death. We're going to figure out what is it we're going to do. We're going to write requirement after requirement. We're going to pick this thing to the minutia of all possible minutia, submit it for review, uh, get feedback, go ahead and do it again. Um, this doesn't work either. So you, you're probably with me when you're thinking that the real operative question is what does it mean to aim? What does it mean to figure out what's next? And... In the true spirit of TED, I'm going to take an enormously complex topic, boil it down to one slide, and then boil it down to another simpler slide. And I ask your forgiveness and forbearance in advance of this. But when thinking about product management, there are a lot of things that you need to do before you start that produce a framework in which you can be successful and that give you some touchstones that you can use to go back and figure out, is what you did the right thing? What's next? And there are these following six things. Yes, we've all heard of vision and mission. It's the thing on the website buried down there, a few pages down, that's written like something assembled by a committee. Right? Yeah. Vision. We have a vision. We have a mission. Um, they're enormously important. A vision is where you're headed. What is the world going to look like when you're done? What is the world you want to bring into being? And people without vision... Um, can get things done, but they're very, uh, in my opinion, very often not able to bring people along with them, whether that vision is for good or evil. So the vision is the world as you would like to see it. The mission 
is what you intend to do to bring that mission about. And those of you like me who grew up on Star Trek know the most famous mission statement of all is uttered by Captain Kirk <laughs> to explore strange new worlds. Here, repeat. Um, when you wake up every day, you set yourself to a task. What is that mission? Um, how do you intend to achieve that vision that you've set up? Now, notice we're not talking about what you're actually going to build, what the organization looks like. These are your guiding principles. And the third thing, curiously enough, that you must have discussed and written down are your values. Who are you? What is the personality? What are the uh, relationships you're going to bring to your pursuit of this? Do you value life? Do you value cooperation? Do you value your customers more than just taking their money? Writing these three things down comes before you write your business plan, comes before you set hands to keyboards. And if you have not written these things down, and you have set your hands to the keyboards, and you have started selling things, don't worry, just take your hands off the keyboards, sit down, and figure them out for yourself. The three final things are a little more classic B-School. Once you kind of know who you are and the world that you want to see come about, there are people who are, you're going to need to motivate to help you get there your customers, the people you need to serve in order to achieve this outcome. You have to figure out who they are, how many of them there are. It's really easy to build a product for one person, yourself. It's very tragic to build a product for one customer. And if you think about who you're serving and are there enough of them to sustain you, is that market going to be here a few years from now? You'll be in a position to, before you even start spending money, figure out, is this worthwhile? And in a few minutes, I'll share with you what the implications of these things to the Encyclopedia of Life. And finally, positioning and competition. Positioning is the unique place that you want to occupy in the mind of your customer and the markets you serve, the unique space. Some people call this unique selling proposition. I believe in the Trout and Reese way of talking about this as positioning. When they think of the problems they have, do they think of you? And what do you need to do to occupy that space? This leads you to the capabilities your product or service needs to have in order to succeed. Because if you don't have those capabilities, people will not magically start believing them and magically start using your product. And the final element of aiming is your competition. Believe it or not, for most problems that people perceive as urgent, pervasive, and they have a desire to fix, they're addressing it in some way. Some way that doesn't involve what you're doing. Competition can be as simple as they're suffering and they're okay with that. It could be a whole range of different products. It could be a range of different sources. Um, the world has gotten along without an encyclopedia of life. But what can we do across all of these things to create something that is going to endure, be useful, and is going to really delight people? And so when you, when you distill these six things together, and I know you will when you go home because this is on tape and you're all taking notes, you get this. Knowing where you are and where you're going is what the product management types call a roadmap. This does not, however, tell you how you're going to get there. Now, a couple hundred years ago, this vast gulf called the Atlantic Ocean was a real barrier for people getting from Washington, D.C. to Paris. But there were a lot of people who did. Benjamin Franklin, big Francophile. Thomas Jefferson, they made it. It wasn't easy. But they had a vision. They had a mission. They understood what their values were that they were going to carry with them. They understood who their customers were, who they were serving, the people of the United States. They understood the positioning that they brought with them, and they understood who was competing with them, and they figured out how to cross that barrier. The how is the daily work that you invest in achieving all those three things and six things in your roadmap. Now, it's easier to get from D.C. to Paris today, but you still have to do all of the background work to give yourself the, 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 the information, the justification you need to do a trip, especially if you're traveling with teenagers. <sighs> Any of you who've done that know just how incredibly hard it is. So what does all of this mean to an encyclopedia of life? And what, is, what does it all mean to where we are today? Um, back 
at the beginning of 2010, uh, the Encyclopedia of Life had tremendous technology. We were able to aggregate information from trusted sources all around the world and assemble that information and put it into all the, different, uh, all the different places in a database so that when you went to this Encyclopedia of Life website, which didn't look like this, you could type in a name and get something. But is that what the encyclopedia was all about? We determined when we sat down and really talked through those six steps that our vision of global access to knowledge of life on Earth had some very important implications to what was next. We needed to build something that was engaging, that was personal, that was accessible. And so we built something that if you speak English, Arabic, or Spanish, you can have a full experience in those languages. And if you're a person with disabilities, it accommodates screen readers. We made it so that as you move through this product that you could personalize it and create your own collection. What matters to you? What's the story you want to tell? Because truth be told, if I think about who my core audience is, I'm thinking about people who are at that first cusp of wanting to learn about nature. You ever seen an eight-year-old or nine-year-old when they get their hands on a lot of pictures of dolphins? They get really excited, they get engaged, and they want to learn more. We built this for everybody. We built this for you. Because frankly, there are a lot of you. And we believe that if all of you have an interest in life on Earth, and we make it easy for you to get that information, you'll feel compelled perhaps to share a little bit about why you're interested in. You'll learn the name of something. You'll take interest in going and taking a picture of something around you, of making an observation, of finding a community that shares your passion for what you want to do. And if we delight you in that regard, because we started with vision and we worked our way down and built a roadmap, then we've succeeded. We've succeeded because we identified it's important to ready ourselves, to aim with a roadmap, and then to do the work of delivering this for all of you and keeping score. Thank you.